Good evening and welcome along to this Church at Home worship service as we continue our study in Mark's Gospel. This week reflecting on the words of verses 14 to 29 of Mark chapter 6. God willing, and next Sunday evening there will be no in-person worship service, but we will be sharing a special service produced by the moderator of the General Assembly and that will be available through our usual online channels. Let's turn our hearts to worship God and read those words, the familiar words of Paul writing to the Philippians in Philippians 1 verse 21, where Paul says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. As we prepare our hearts for worship, let's unite together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you, the author of life, the one who breathes into us all that we need to live. May we, moment by moment, be utterly dependent upon you, knowing that without your enabling, your empowering, we can do nothing. We cannot serve you. We cannot walk closely with you. We need you to touch us, to change us, to make your word live in us and indeed to speak through us. Lord, as we contemplate your word in these moments, we ask that they would be a blessing to us. They would work transformation in our lives. We wouldn't simply come to them and then walk away from them unmoved. Lord, we come to worship you. That's our heart's desire to serve you in this world, to make you our priority, you our focus. Do forgive us for the times when we feel, when we make other things much more important. May it be that you are our all in all. You are our heart's delight. Lord, may we love you. May we live for you. May we make your will and purpose known. And may we see you through the sowing of the good seed of your word. Draw men and women, boys and girls to yourself. So bless this hour of worship as we join together around your word and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together the words of the hymn, My Hope Rests Firm on Christ Alone. Should 
let's turn on and read together the words for our uh, study and reflection this evening. Mark chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 14. Mark 6 verses 14 through to verse 29. This is God's word to us. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to, wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish. I will give up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And we give thanks to God for this reading from his holy and inspired word. Let's once again pray as we prepare our hearts to think about how we might apply this text to our lives. Let's pray. Father, we come and we are thankful to you for the boldness of your servants of old. How against such fierce opposition they stood up and stood out. They spoke truth and many, like John, paid the ultimate price, losing his life for the cause of your kingdom. Lord, in these days, may we speak out with boldness. May we know what to say. May we know how to challenge, how to confront a sinful world, how to make known your truth. Not as those who are judgmental and self-righteous, but as those who are brokenhearted at the effects of sin and its destructiveness in this world. Lord, give us wisdom. Teach us from this passage and may we apply it to our hearts and live it out in our world for the saving of precious souls and the glory of your name. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The murder of Sarah Everard sent shockwaves throughout our society and led to calls being made for action to be taken to ensure the safety of women on the streets of our nation. This outcry has been further heightened following the recent murder of two women in Rathcoole Estate. 
and the BBC News website led with this headline. Sarah Everard, how a woman's death sparked a nation's soul searching. While it is absolutely correct that there ought to be a response to ensure women's safety, whatever the circumstances, let's be very clear that the one thing that this nation hasn't done is to search its soul. Were we to do that, were we to collectively look within, we would, we would understand that the human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, as God's word tells us in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. And because of the nature of the human heart, what we need is not new campaigns, but new hearts. We need conversion. We need transformation by the Spirit of God through his word. Yet, we live in a world where murder, even sexually motivated murder, is the subject of much popular entertainment. Just to use one example, the American TV drama Law and Order Special Victims Unit has already made 485 episodes with two more seasons in the pipeline. Now, I enjoy a good crime drama, as I'm sure many of you do. But we must ask ourselves, what is society using to feed its collective soul? And, and because of our choices, what should we expect the outcome to be? If we make our entertainment these things, then we ought to expect that the outcome will be death on our streets. As we turn to God's word, and particularly here to Mark chapter 6, we discover that the feelings of society that we are witnessing in these difficult days are not exclusive to our age. The human heart has always, since the fall, been desperately wicked. Verses 14 to 29 of chapter 6 are a diversion from the flow of the story, which so far has been focusing on the dynamic and far-reaching ministry of Jesus. However, this section is linked to what has gone before by the question about the identity of Jesus. We thought last Sunday evening of how the people of Nazareth concluded that the Jesus being known to them as the carpenter and the son of Mary was, was someone that they took offence at and they refused to believe and respond to his preaching. This week, we discover that Herod too has a personal view on the identity of Jesus. We read in verses 14 to 16, King Herod heard of it, that is of the ministry of Jesus. For Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous signs are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Without delving too deeply into this, there's a little bit of irony here. That Herod is more than happy to believe that someone could rise from the dead. God willing, next weekend on Resurrection Sunday, we'll, we'll note how the disciples of Jesus were slow and reluctant to believe in resurrection. In spite of all that Jesus had been trying to teach them to prepare them for the events of that first Easter season. Now, in our Advent series, if you can remember back to just before Christmas, we thought a little bit about the character called King Herod the Great. The one who, in a jealous rage, sought to have the infant Jesus put to death by killing all the babies, all the baby boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity. The Herod we encounter in our text for this evening is a different Herod, another Herod, Herod the Great's not so great son, Herod Jr. After the death of Herod the Great, the kingdom was divided between his three sons, each being given a share. And this Herod, history records not as a king, 
although he dreadfully wished to be a king, and indeed Mark describes him as such in our text. But he's known as Tetrarch, ruler of a quarter of the kingdom, although it was actually divided into thirds, but don't worry too much about that. And Herod, this Herod, is distinguished in history as Herod Antipas. Antipas means against all. Now, attempting to explain and unravel all the twists and turns in the family tree of Herod that leads to these events in our passage for study would take our. So let me cheat and I'm going to quote the words of the late Ray Stadman, a well-known minister for so many years of Peninsula Bible Church. Stedman said this, The marital entanglements of the whole family of Herods are incredible. They started with Herod the Great, who married five different wives and had children by them all. Then the progeny began to marry each other and had children and each other's progeny. So there were cousins marrying, and in the case of Herod, Herod Antipas, he married his niece, Herodias, who had been the wife of his half-brother, Philip. Now to complicate the story, there was another half-brother also named Philip, but I'm not going to try and sort that out all out for you. It's enough to recognise that this was a public scandal of that day. And John the Baptist evidently had publicly rebuked the king for seducing his brother's wife and marrying her. Herod did not seem to be greatly offended by John's rebuke, but Herodias was. She insisted on John's arrest and later his murder. We're introduced to these sin-smeared events because Herod assumes that Jesus, whose fame is spreading throughout the region, is John the Baptist, whom he had beheaded, but now Herod believes him to be resurrected. This was, he concluded, was the reason for the miraculous powers that were able to be displayed in the ministry of Jesus. But why had Herod behaved in this manner? What are the events that led to the death? of John the Baptist. Mark wants to fill in the details for us. And as I've already noted, all that unfolds revolves around the matter of sexual sin. Herod had discarded his wife and taken his brother Philip's wife, called Herodias, as his own. And John the Baptist, like all the great prophets who had gone before him, had no fear of the authorities of his day. He boldly dared to speak out and preach against the sins of Herod. We read verse 18. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Every Christian must understand that to stand up And to speak out against the evils within our society is not a passport to popularity. There is always a cost involved in challenging the sinward trends of the world around us. Yes, those who go along with the tide and vacillation and weakness will get an easy ride. But those who dare to challenge and indeed to confront the sin in in the hearts of men and women will be put in their place. In Jesus' case, with nails, if necessary. Yet, God's people need to raise a prophetic voice. We need to persistently call our nation, our world, back to biblical standards, both in the words that we speak and by the lives that we live. These two things must be done. There must be consistency in our living. The world around us, as it usually does, may choose to ignore our voices. But we must not be silent. Whatever the cost may be, God's standards must be made clear and they must be upheld by those who claim to be his followers, no matter what the price we may be required to pay. And yes, we are seeing more and more that when God's people stand up and speak out against the immorality of our age, they find themselves coming under attack. Because as we speak out, we disturb the conscience of the world and they will find a way to silence us. 
And that's what happened to John. But note, Herod, rather than have John instantly dealt with, at first had him imprisoned for his preaching. Perhaps that's a fate that many preachers deserve. And strangely, we discover that, that Herod was drawn to the words of John like a moth to a flame. Look at verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. This preacher was condemning him roundly, and yet he took pleasure in listening to what he had to say. Perhaps it was that Herod found pleasure in John's words because he was so different to those who normally surrounded him and those he heard so well. For Herod understood that these people who were in his court were completely corrupt. His minions addressed him in their fawning tones, but he could see through that to their self-seeking motives. John was very different. Different altogether. He was not tarnished by the same stains of sin as these others. He was a man who knew God, and that was clearly evident in everything about him. And the presence of holiness in the life of John as an individual was both a winsome but yet a powerful force. It's said of Robert Murray McShane, that great preacher of Dundee who died as a young man, that when he mounted the pulpit steps at the beginning of a service, people were moved, some were even converted, simply because of the aura of holiness that surrounded this man of God. Even before he spoke a word, hearts were touched. Or think of Mary, Queen of Scots, who is reported to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than I fear an army of 10,000 men. John had a similar effect on Herod. The king in his fortress, surrounded by his soldiers and courtiers, feared the preacher in his cells. And the word of a, a godly man, can still strike fear into the hearts of sinners. And yet, at the same time, they, they find this individual attractive because there's something about true sincerity and holiness that is meant to make us drawn in attractiveness to it. Acts 5 and verses 12 to 14 capture this paradox well. There we read, now, many signs and wonders were regularly done by the people, or among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. In those early days of the church in the city of Jerusalem, the believers were highly regarded and yet they were feared. People stayed clear of them and yet many were drawn into their number. And sometimes we convince ourselves that to speak out into this world, to speak out against sin, is to waste our time and to speak in vain. But it is not so. The declaration of God's word always makes a difference and some by the working of God's spread, will be transformed by it. Now Herod had committed many sins, but one in particular is highlighted here, the taking of Herodias as his wife. As we've already noted, Herodias was the daughter of Herod's half-brother Aristobulus, and thus Herod's niece. And when he met her in Rome, she was married to another of his half-brothers, Philip, Herod, Philip, and therefore she was also his sister-in-law. And perhaps it was because she was forbidden to him that this created the desire in his heart to have her as his own. Herod seduced her, persuading her to leave Philip and to become his wife. All of this, as John made perfectly clear, was in direct contravention 
of the law of God. And while Herod had a healthy respect for Job, his wife Herodias did not and harbored a deep hatred for him. It seems that she feared that the impact of John's words might, might change the heart of her husband. Perhaps she was concerned that they might be so effectual as to provoke him to break off this sinful relationship. Consequently, she was always on the lookout for an opportunity to have the prophet's voice silenced. As we read, that opportunity came when Herod threw a great party for all his friends. Part of the entertainment on that event, at that event, was the erotic dance that was performed by his daughter, or by the daughter of Herodias. We know from historical records that, that her name was Salome, but she's unnamed in scripture, yet often you'll find in quizzes on TV that uh, that's a question what was the name of this daughter and that name is not recorded it's not a bible question which infuriates me but influenced by the wine that he had drunk and perhaps the opportunity to show off before his friends Herod makes this foolish promise to the young girl offering her up half of his kingdom which really is not much of a promise since he only ruled at the behest or discretion of the Romans. He had nothing to give. But we see in Herod a, a tragic caricature of the world, that he is willing to spend a fortune to be entertained, only ultimately to be left empty and unsatisfied. People in, in this world are those who, who sacrifice their souls in the pursuit of the trivial, but never find what gives lasting satisfaction. Here, the cunning Herodias, reminiscent of another evil queen of centuries before her Jezebel, contrives to place her husband in an embarrassing position and directs her daughter to ask for the head of John the Baptist. Poor Herod. He was a proud man who had made this rash promise in front of all his guests. And he would be appear very foolish if he didn't follow through on his commitment. Oh yes, he was prepared to dismiss his commitments to former wives and to brothers and anyone else, but on this occasion, oh, pride takes over. So the command is given, the execution was carried out, and the faithful messenger of God paid the ultimate price for his courageous ministry. In the thinking of the, this wicked king, it was better for John to lose his head than for Herod to lose face. Like his father before him, he revealed that he counted life cheap in order to maintain his own reputation. And this is a tragic tale. The tragedy is not in the death of John because all of us will die. And God's child can face such death with confidence, even like Paul, with eager anticipation. Paul writes those words with which you began our service. Philippians 1.21, he says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So John did not lose out through death. No, the tragedy here is Herod's failure to respond to the preaching of the word of God. Yes, he enjoyed the message. Yes, he enjoyed it, but he was not changed by it. He lingered at the doorway to salvation, but ultimately turned his back on it and walked into the pathway of sin. We know from the surrounding verses that the disciples commissioned by Jesus went out into the local villages to deliver this message, a message of repentance, Mark 6 verse 12. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. John's message to Herod was no doubt the same. Repent, turn from your sins. It seems that many heeded the message of the disciples and the power of God was revealed in their hearts and lives, but not in Herod's heart. And he would face the eternal consequences for his failure to respond positively. God is ever 
calling out to the people of this world that they would search their souls, that they would understand the sinfulness of their hearts and they would turn around and leave such pathways. They would turn their backs on the empty pleasures of the world and follow after Jesus into the adventure of a lifetime, the, the only way of life that truly satisfies. Yes, it's a perilous pathway because of the sinful world in which we live. And yet those who journey in this way are those who will ultimately prevail. As God's people carry on this prophetic task to challenge a world lost in its sin. Yes, the message may be rejected. Yes, we may be persecuted, but still we must speak out because we understand that the good seed does produce the harvest. As Jesus explained in chapter four, sometimes 30, sometimes 60, even a hundredfold. God's word makes an impact. Hearts and lives are transformed. Not everyone feels as Herod failed to make a response that leads to life that lasts forever. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your word is truth and it challenges the wickedness of human hearts. Lord, may we be those who are emboldened by you to speak out that word into a needy world. Father, forgive us if we have been silent when we should have spoken up. Forgive us, Lord, if we have been too tolerant of sinful practices around us and we've allowed our world to slide into sin, making no efforts to challenge this path and pattern. Forgive us. Give us wisdom, Lord. Show us what we ought to do. How to be effective in this, in this challenge you set before us. And Father, we pray that many, many who hear the gospel, many who hear your word speaking to them, would truly repent, would turn from their sin, would walk into the way that leads to life everlasting. That they would find, even in this Easter season, that Jesus is living and welcoming those into eternal life who believe in him. Lord, give us a holy boldness. Make your church attractive to the world, that men and women might come among our number, finding in Christ true satisfaction for their souls. For in his name we pray these things. The name above all names of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing in praise the words of come thy fount of every blessing.
for taking time to share in this service. I hope there's been something in it that has helped and challenged you and enabling you to serve Christ well in this world. Now I may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this night and forevermore. Amen.